Hello and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we'll be taking a look at how one discovery led a whole family to question their childhood and what they really knew about the man that they'd called Poppy Cliff. Poppy Cliff was born Clifford Bartholomew on the 30th of January 1930, but when the Grey family came to know Poppy Cliff 50 years later, he was going by the name of Cliff Palmer. The six children of the family had no reason to question this name and no reason to question where their mother, Merle, had met this seemingly lovely man. After 20 years of a peaceful and happy marriage between Cliff and Merle, her children were shocked to find newspaper clippings in Merle's belongings that had pictures of Poppy Cliff with the name Clifford Bartholomew, calling him Australia's worst mass murderer. Poppy Cliff had lived a whole other life before he'd been arrested and sent to prison for his crimes and it was in prison that he'd became pen pals with Merle Gray. Merle was a Christian woman who had strong beliefs about forgiveness and mercy but when her children were clearing out her belongings after her death and found the newspaper clippings that told the story about how Poppy Cliff had murdered his first family, they were shocked by how far Merle's forgiveness could go. Clifford Bartholomew and his first wife, Heather, had been married for 20 years before the cracks in their marriage had begun to form. They lived a quiet life in Australia's rural countryside where Clifford worked on a dairy farm. As part of his employment, the couple were able to rent a small house on the land, which was a great perk for a young family in the early 1950s who were just getting settled into married life. Heather had been married once before and had a son from her previous marriage that Clifford treated as his own. It wasn't long before the couple had their first child together, a son who they named Neville. Neville was quickly followed by sibling after sibling and life in the family home became extremely busy with Clifford working hard on the farm to provide for his family and Heather looking after their many children. Neighbours stated that they seemed to have a simple but happy life together. As the children grew, they also began to help around the farm, taking some of the responsibilities from Clifford and Heather. By 1971, the Bartholomews, now both aged 40, had had eight children, with one of them dying during infancy. By this time, the eldest son from Heather's first marriage had moved out, leaving seven children, ranging from the ages of 19 down to four, living at the house with them. With a very full home and the demands of a large family, after many years on the farm, tensions began to grow between Clifford and Heather. In July 1971, things reached boiling point when Heather told Clifford to leave the house. He packed up his things and moved in with his stepmother, who had a house about five miles away from the dairy farm. Why things became so strained between Clifford and Heather is unclear, especially when more and more rumours about the two began to circulate after the events that would follow, but there are two main theories. The first theory was that the couple were going through hard times as a result of Heather's mismanagement of Clifford's wages and her poor housekeeping skills, but Clifford's landlord would later testify that he'd watched them work through hard times before and that he'd never once seen them argue or even not get along. The other theory involves an affair. A few months before Heather asked Clifford to leave the home, they had actually taken in a lodger. The man was never named, but he was reportedly an injured veteran looking for a place to stay while he recovered from his wounds. A few weeks after he moved in, Clifford began accusing Heather of having an affair with this man, but every time he brought it up, Heather would become agitated and shut the conversation down. Heather's behaviour towards Clifford reportedly grew colder and colder and rumours circulated about petty things which Heather would do to Clifford, such as ignoring him when he was at home and washing everyone's laundry, including their lodgers, but picking out Clifford's clothes so that he would have to launder them himself. Whether the rumours and theory about her affair were true or not, what we do know is that she asked Clifford to leave. Clifford remained hopeful that things would work out between Heather and himself and he continued to make sure that he spent time in the family home and also with his children. 
He still worked at the farm, which meant that he was around most days, but when he tried to set up times with Heather so that they could spend time together as a family, he quickly noticed a shift in his family's behaviour towards him. He later said that every time he came home, his children acted colder and more distant towards him, and he realised that it was more important than ever that he made things right with Heather before he lost all of them. He called Heather and they set up a date for him to come over again. Father's Day in 1971 fell on the 5th of September and Heather agreed to be home with the children so Clifford could spend time with everyone. However, when the day arrived, she tried to change their plans. Heather's sister, Winnie Keane, was visiting that same day with her 18-month-old son, Daniel, so Heather tried to convince Clifford not to come over because of her visitors. However, Clifford was excited to spend Father's Day with his family and went over to the farm anyway. When he arrived, Heather was out with her sister and some of the other children had gone out as well. Neville was home, so the father and son sat down together to drink a couple of cans of beer as they waited for everyone else to return. When Heather and the rest of the children arrived back home, they didn't seem happy to see Clifford, but he tried to smooth things over with them and shared out the cans of drink that he had brought for the children. They eventually sat down for a family dinner, after which they all headed to the family room where they listened to records and watched some TV. Once the younger children had gone to bed, Clifford decided it was the right time to talk to Heather again. He asked her if he could move back into the family home to be closer to her and the children, but Heather refused and sent Clifford back to his stepmother's home. He arrived there at about 9.30 that night, grabbed himself a cup of coffee and reflected on everything that had happened that day and what his future looked like, coming to the realisation that in all likelihood he was facing a divorce. Clifford didn't know what to do. He didn't want to lose his children, but couldn't come up with an idea that would save his family. After failing to sleep, he got out of bed, picked up his keys and got in his car to head back to the farm. He had come up with a plan. He was going to get Heather out of the home and into the shed by the barn where he would kill her. With Heather out of the picture, there would be no one to take his children away from him. He believed that he would be able to move back into the house and he wouldn't lose anyone else. He pulled up at the back gate of the house around half past midnight, stopping by the shed first to pick up a rubber mallet, a rifle and a supply of bullets before making his way inside. His plan began to fall apart at the second step. Winnie and her son Daniel were staying at the house that night, which meant that two of Clifford and Heather's children were sleeping in the same bed as their mother. They were all asleep and Clifford wasn't sure how he could get Heather out of the room without waking up the children. He put the rifle down in the corridor outside the door and crept in, trying to make sure that he didn't wake his children up. He then hit Heather across the head with the rubber mallet. Maybe he thought that it would be enough to knock her out or even kill her, but what actually happened was Heather woke up and, when she saw her husband standing over her in the middle of the night with a mallet in his hand, she started screaming. This woke up almost everyone in the house. It was Winnie who got to the bedroom door first and saw Clifford hitting Heather across the head with the mallet. Realising what was happening, Winnie grabbed the rifle from outside the door, but instead of firing, she took off and ran towards the front of the house. Clifford realised that Winnie was going to get help and chased after her. Leaving Heather unconscious on the bed, Clifford caught up with Winnie as she was desperately trying to get to the car. Clifford then hit Winnie with the mallet, but she managed to slip around him and take off again before Clifford could do anything else to her. She didn't get very far before Clifford was close enough behind her to hit across the head with the mallet once again and Winnie fell to the ground. The blow wasn't enough to knock her out but it was enough to keep her on the ground whilst Clifford hit her a few more times until she lost consciousness. Clifford went back to where Winnie had left the rifle and then headed back to the house to finish what he'd come to do. He returned to Heather who was lying on the bed unconscious and shot her in the head. By then, everyone else in the house had been awoken by the noise. Clifford's children had just witnessed him murdering their mother. Not knowing what to do about it, Clifford then raised his rifle and shot his 17-year-old daughter, Christine, in the head. He described this moment later to the police and said that that was when he'd realised that he loved his children too much to lose them. 
He took off through the house, shooting the children in the head when they didn't put up a fight or hitting them with the mallet before shooting them if they did. He then went to find Winnie's son, Daniel, who he shot before heading out of the house and approaching Winnie. She was still lying on the ground outside, barely conscious. He then shot her before covering her body with bin bags. He had killed everyone who was on the property. Clifford then collected a few of his things and wrote a letter to the police detailing what he had done. He then called the police and waited for them to come to the house and arrest him. The police found 10 victims at the scene, 40-year-old Heather, her seven children, Neville, Christine, Sharon, Helen, Gregory, Roger and Sandra. Heather's 23-year-old sister Winnie and Winnie's 18-month-old son, Daniel. In a matter of hours, Clifford Bartholomew had gone from desperately trying to save his marriage to one of the biggest mass killers in Australia's history. He didn't try to defend himself or his actions and immediately confessed to murdering his entire family. He was initially sentenced to death by hanging, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison when his lawyers were able to prove that he was not guilty by reason of insanity. After a series of legal appeals, Clifford was released from prison on the 10th of December 1979, after serving only seven and a half years of his sentence. It was during his time in prison that he became pen pals with Merle Gray, who was waiting for him when he was released from prison. Clifford and Merle married and he became known as Poppy Cliff to her six children. Clifford died in 2002 and the children only discovered his true identity after Merle died 10 years later and they found newspaper clippings and documents detailing his crimes. Merle and Clifford had lived together for over 20 years and his past came as a total shock to his stepchildren who struggled to reconcile the details of his crimes with the kind man that they had known. One of the children, Ralph Gray, stated, I couldn't believe it. None of us can. To know the full story is horrendous. He just isn't the man we thought we knew. He never disrespected our mother and they hardly had a raised voice in more than 20 years together. He was a gentleman. He loved us and we all loved him. Suddenly finding out that the man who had become their stepfather was responsible for the deaths of his entire family must have been a terrible shock to the Grey family and undoubtedly would paint their childhood in a far darker light, leaving them so confused over what to think about the man that they had called Poppy Cliff. That concludes today's case. One of the shocking parts was how quick it is to cover saying the names of the ten innocent victims. Here is what I said earlier in the story. 40-year-old Heather, her seven children, Neville, Christine, Sharon, Helen, Gregory, Roger and Sandra. Heather's 23-year-old sister Winnie and Winnie's 18-month-old son, Daniel. Rest in peace to all the victims. Please add comments down below and click like and subscribe. Thanks for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. A lady called Nolene Partridge was also at the Father's Day gathering, but left hours before the incident because something wasn't right. Goodbye.